Okay, morning everyone. Uh, welcome to this first morning session. Um, hopefully the recordings will work a little bit better than what we tried on the team session. Okay, so this morning session, we are going to have a look at some of the elements of business administration. As we go through the course and the recordings, I'll tell you guys what is important for real life and what is important for this assignment specifically, and then what is also important for your business plan and other elements of this course. So I'm going to just share our PowerPoint presentation with you guys. Okay, so Law Business Finance, my name is Jakub Kronier and I am going to do the Law Business Finance portion with you guys. Um, I'm going to talk nice and slowly so that if you download, you don't miss stuff. I don't normally talk like this. Okay, so I wonder if I start off by giving you some notes on the assignment itself. There's uh, I've been marking this for quite a while, so I've seen a lot of the mistakes that the people make. So the first note there is you guys must please convert your assignments into PDF. The tool that we use for the marking can't be used on Excel or Word. So it has got to be in a PDF format. Then secondly, you'll see there's a plagiarism declaration that you have to sign. I need you to please include that declaration in the same PDF as your assignment, because what sometimes happens is if you upload the declaration second, then it throws out your assignment and we only get the declaration and that will obviously uh, go through as zero on your marks. Okay, then another problem that we have is a lot of guys secure the PDF files. The moment you secure them, we can't mark them. So that will also be a zero on the first time and you will have to resubmit it. Um, so make sure that when you do your assignments, it's not marked as secured with the PDF security function. Okay, so in this lecture, what my plan is, is to give you guys a skeleton for the assignment itself. So I'm going to teach you the formats, what it should look like, T accounts, ledgers, all of these type of things. And we will do uh, questions and examples throughout this lecture, which is very narrowly based on the assignment. So if you work through this, your chances of passing this assignment or having the knowledge that you need to pass the assignment will be very good. So in the assignment, so well, the skeletons that we give you in this lecture, use them and then as you read through the assignment, just go line by line, transaction by transaction and transactions into the skeletons that we are going to work with in the afternoon session. Okay, then in accounting theories and rules apply. So it's slightly different. You guys have all studied law. Law is very factually based, that is the law, and it changes per scenario. Where in accounting, we work more with theories and rules. So if you understand what an asset, an equity, or a liability is, then you can apply that through each type of transaction. You can apply the rule, and anyone can give you any type of transaction, and you should be able to know where to slot it in into this skeleton. Okay, then as I said in the lecture, we are going to do most type of transactions that occur in the assignment. There are certain variations that I've put in. It's not exactly the same, but obviously I can't give you guys the whole assignment and all the answers to that, but it will be very narrowly based and it will teach you all the principles that you will need to pass the assignment. Okay, then another note is I'm saying as soon as we are done with the LBF course, go and do your assignment while the lectures are still fresh in your mind. Okay, now this is being recorded, so I suppose you guys can listen to it a few times. It's not the dilemma that the guys had that uh, 
where they attend the lectures. But yeah, best to do it as soon as possible while in all the info is still fresh in your minds. OK, so most of you guys will be here or attending this course because you are going to start your own business or you are going to become a director of a company. So the company that I have specialized in legal accounting and we have a whole lot of clients uh, or startup businesses that sign up with us as clients. So due to that, I've seen, well, I've helped to get a lot of businesses off the ground, but I've also seen quite a lot of businesses fail. So some of the very simple notes, but I do want to bring it under your attention and I do want you to consider that before taking the step of resigning from your current job and starting a new job. So firstly, lectures are mainly, oh, OK, lectures are mainly focused on the assignment, but it also includes pointers on starting and running your own business. OK, reasons why startup businesses fail. First thing is you have to be driven and you have to accept longer working hours. Um, if you are leaving your current job with the idea that you will be working less hours, uh, you are probably doing it for the wrong reason. And the reason for that is very simple. At your current job, you are mainly focused on writing fees. So you will hope to be billable for six or eight hours a day. So if you do the math on how much money you will make if you do that for yourself, then it looks as if it will be very easy to write a whole lot of fees and earn your own or earn more than what you currently are. The problem with that is at your current job, you've got an accountant that handles all of the accounting and all of the banking. You've got couriers that do all of the traveling for you and you've got assistants that help you. If you do your own or start up your own business, you are going to have to fulfill all of those roles. So you will have to write fees. But in between writing fees, you will also have to go and do your banking, do all the payments to suppliers, keep track of who you owe money, track, keep track of who owes you money. So you'll have to do all of the banking. You'll have to do all of the administration around the firm. And if you take that into account, you actually need to put in a whole lot of more hours um, than just thinking that you'll wake up go sit in front of your PC and be billable for six or seven hours a day. OK, then another reason why we see a lot of businesses fail is they don't have a source of clients. So it's it's all great to leave your job because you don't like your boss anymore. But the problem is when you start your own business, you need to have a 100 percent plan for where you will source your clients from. So whether it be at a sports club, a lot of people meet their clients in pubs, wherever it is, or if you poach them from your old firm, but have an idea or a plan as to where you are going to, going to get your clients from. You might specialize in a certain field and then you will market and do advertising at places that is specific to that field of uh, or to that legal field. So how you do it is not, we won't go into that, but make sure that you do have a plan for this. Okay, then I'm saying set controls and processes, controls, processes and procedures up from day one. The reason for this is we have a lot of clients where they start up their business and it's a very simple one man practitioner. And uh, within the first year or two, suddenly the business explodes and everything is there's a whole lot of clients, a whole lot of staff, and suddenly they aren't in control of the business anymore. And that's where things start slipping through the cracks. Uh, where you have fraud in your business or you accidentally pay out more funds from trust where you're supposed to. So what my advice to you is set your controls up from day one, as if you are running a massive firm, even if you are only a sole practitioner, and that will gear you up for when your business grows and when you eventually get staff and partners and all of that to successfully be able to manage all of these processes, manage your staff and manage your business properly. OK, then the next one is check up on staff. Do not trust anyone. Um, through my years in the industry, I've seen and helped with and worked on many fraud cases and in most of those cases, the opening line by the practitioner or by the partner is we would have never expected that person to do that. 
So remember, even if you have an accountant and your accountant makes a mess of what they were supposed to do, you are still ultimately liable for that. You are going to have to walk into the disciplinary hearing and explain to the guys there why you did not check up on your accountant and check up on your accounting records, whether it's compliant, whether everything's in order, whether there's trust debit balances, uh, whether your bank reconciles, all of these type of processes, and on your staff as well. Um, the moment you start appointing clerks or junior staff, make sure that you keep track of where they are, what they are doing, that they are actually filing what they're supposed to. Um, we've seen a few horror cases with that, with guys saying that they file documents and they just never do. Um, so hopefully it's it's definitely not always the case, but it is there. So the moment you have your controls and processes in place and you can check up on your staff, they know they won't be. The moment they know there is no gap to commit that fraud or take that chance, chances of it happening will be a lot less. OK, and then I said be in control of your trust account. You make sure that you are the only one that has access to your trust account. Yes, if you do have at a point business becomes too big and you will have to have staff or accountants that manage your trust account, but try to keep whatever controls you can in place. Uh, for instance, get your accountants to only load payments and that you still release all of the trust payments so that you just have in the back of your mind what is being paid out of your trust account. And for instance, take steps like they have a function to load payments on the trust, but they are not allowed to edit or create new beneficiaries. So they can't then edit the beneficiaries to their own banking accounts and uh, drain monies from your trust account in such a way. And then also you have to review the accounting reports that they present you to make sure that everything does reconcile. Your banks reconcile, there's no debtors on your trust creditor list, um, so those type of controls I'm going to go through with you. I'm going to give you like a four point little check to do when we get to that point to make sure that you understand what checks to do to make sure that you don't have a trust shortfall. OK, so what's the purpose of having accounting records? So what I'm saying is if I give you a box of slips and that's full of invoices and supporting documents, and I ask you, please tell me what your profit for the year was. Your chances of successfully doing that will not be very good. So from there, we take that box of slips and we write that into cash books and into ledgers. So in the afternoon session, we are going to start with cash books and ledgers, and you will then be able to see what and how that works. So when we get to that point, your cash book and ledgers are basically just the number of T accounts and that's spread out throughout the page. So for you to be able to see uh, what your profit is will still be impossible at that stage, but we one point closer. So for instance, if you look at your bank ledger and I ask you how much is your bank balance, you can go to your bank T account and you can check there what your closing balance are. Or if I tell you how much were your fees for the year, you can go to your professional fees ledger and you can quickly add up everything there and you can tell me how much your fees are. But if I ask you what is your net profit or your asset value of the company, then you will still not be able to do that just from the cash book and ledgers. So from the cash book and ledgers, we draft a trial balance. Now the trial balance, you guys will also see when we are going to, well, we're going to handle that in the next week morning class and then you will be able to see what a trial balance looks like. But basically what it is, is a summary of all of your T accounts, the debit balances and the credit balances. Now the purpose of that is to make sure that there is a debit for every credit. So the moment you make a posting error, for instance, if you debit your bank with 100 Rand and you accidentally credit the client with 1000 Rand, your trial balance will indicate to you that you made a mistake in terms of your debits not matching up with your credits. But from a trial balance, we can still not simply look at a report and see how much was our profit, what, how many assets do we have in the business, those type of things. So then we take the trial balance and we write that into a set of financial statements. Now, a set of financial statements are 
consists of a balance sheet, an income statement, and a cash flow statement. So if I now ask you how much was your profit for the year, you can very simply go to the income statement, look at the last line, which is your income minus expenses, and you can tell me this is the amount of profit that we've made for the year. And if I ask you how much asset you have, you can go to the balance sheet, add up all of the asset line accounts there, and tell me what your asset value is. So the purpose is, or the whole purpose of drafting accounting records is to make it as easy as possible for the users of these records to make financial decisions and to analyze your business. Now, in most cases, the user of these financial statements will be you. You'll have an accountant that drafts them and you have to review them. You need to make sure that all of your expenses are accounted for, because if you don't do that, then you're going to pay more tax than what you're supposed to. And then also from the financial statements, we are going to do budgets and cash flow forecasts. That's also important, especially when you're starting out on your own business, to know how much can you spend and will you, with the current fees that you are earning or projecting to earn, be able to make it through your first year. And then after that, the second target is your three years to trade for three full years. And they reckon if a business can make it through the first three years, then your chances of running that business for the rest of your life is very high. So from financial statements, we're going to look at budgets and cash flow forecasts. Now, of all of these, this morning session is important for real life. The pointers that I'm going to give you here is basically to get you to start up your own business and make sure you comply with all the statutory requirements. The trial balance in the financial statement, oh, then the ledgers, the cash book and ledgers, that is extremely important for your assignment. Almost 80% of the assignment consists of cash book and ledgers. So if you can get that part, your chances of passing this assignment is very well, very good. Then trial balance and financial statements is very important for real life and your business plan, but there's not too much of that in the assignment. And also budgets and cash flows, we're going to look at that, but that is more important for your business plan than what it is for this assignment, but also important for real life. Okay, now we're going to have a quick look at sole prop versus incorporation. So the first point that I said there, you have to have a separate set of accounts for your business. Keep assets, liabilities, income and expenses separate from personal. So what does that mean? When you have an incorporation, that is very simple to do because whatever goes through the incorporation is classified as business. And what you then draw a salary from that and whatever you pay from your salary, that is personal. But what happens in the case of a sole proprietor? So in a sole proprietor, we also require you to run a separate set of accounts for each business that you have. So although it's all accounted for under one legal entity being you as the individual, we still need to have a separate set of accounts where for your legal practice, you'll have a list of your debtors. But if you've got your friend that owes money from down the road, you're not going to include them in that list of debtors. That will be personal debt that's due to you. So we need to have a separate set of accounts for your business only, um, a trust and a business set of accounts if it's a legal practice. Okay, so then I've given you guys a few considerations to take into account when deciding whether you want to trade as a sole prop or an ink when you start up your new business. So if you go, so there's no right or wrong here. If you've got ink, that's fine. If you've got sole prop, that's fine. For the guys who haven't decided yet, I just want to give them a few pointers to make their decision slightly easier. So firstly, incorporations weren't very popular a few years ago, because if you had an incorporation, you had to have a full business audit and a full trust audit. So that basically means your auditors had to come there and not only check and vouch transactions in your trust account, but they also had to do that in your business account. Now, 
under the new companies act that rule has fallen away so on your business side you can now either do only a compilation or if you hold more than five million rand in trust an independent review so the that is a lot less work for the auditors in other words it's a lot less sleep for you to go through and the cost of that is also significantly less than what a full business audit was back in the day. So for that reason, incorporations have become more popular from an administrative perspective. If you incorporate, that will also give you no name protection with the CIPC, where if you're a sole prop, like me being Cronia, there can be 100 Cronia attorneys out there. Then a lot of people always ask, but which one is more tax beneficial? Now, there's no, not getting into too much detail, there's not really a massive benefit or massive difference between the tax for the two entities. Um, the only benefit that you do get is if you fall into the maximum tax bracket, then there's about a 1 1.3, 1.6% benefit that you can get if you do clever planning between your company's income, your personal salary and dividend tax. But like I said, that's actually only when you earn in the maximum tax bracket. If under that, there's no real difference between the two if you structure your taxes correctly. Okay, then just from an admin perspective, if you are a sole proprietor, then you only have to submit one tax return to SARS. So that will be your tax return and the company's financial statements will be included in your tax return. So from an administrative perspective, that is less work. Whereas if you incorporate, you will have to do full tax returns for yourself and for the incorporation, plus these now CIPC annual returns that you also have to complete. Now, that's not from an admin perspective, a massive amount of more admin, but it is. It is slightly less admin to have a sole proprietorship. And then also, I've made a point to say, the moment you are, there's more than one or your number of partners, it makes it easier to transfer partners in and out and transfer the shares when you are an inc. If you go into a partnership, the moment one of the partners leaves the partnership, the entire partnership has to dissolve and a new partnership has to be set up from the start. So based on that, what I suggest to you guys, but again, this is only a suggestion. If you start your own business and you know it's you and only you, you're not really going to ever look at partners or merging or anything like that then go the route of a sole prop. Your admin is going to be less and your costs for running the business will be less. However, if you want to set up your business and make sure you have name protection and you are looking to eventually merge, potentially merge with partners, or if you are merging from the start, then I'll definitely say go the route of an incorporation. It's much easier and much better structured when there's more than one partner. But yeah, that's just the pointer. So if you haven't taken that route, no problem there. Okay, so then I want to have a look at the difference between business and trust. So this has always been the rule. It hasn't changed yet. According to the Law Society Rules 86, you have to have a trust account. So if you run your own legal practice, even if you are never going to use it, you have to open and have a trust account active at any given stage. So then I said, so what does this actually mean? We've made the statement now to say we must have a difference between our business accounting records and our trust accounting records. So what does this mean for people that do Excel bookkeeping? Quite, quite a few people do their accounts or keep their accounts in Excel. That will literally mean having two Excel spreadsheets. You'll have one spreadsheet for your business records and you will have one spreadsheet for your trust records. If you are using non-legal software like Pestle or Manager or any of those type of packages, 
What does that mean to have separate accounting records? That means in Pastel that you must literally have two Pastel databases, one for your business accounting records and a second for your trust accounting records. And then what happens when you have legal accounting software? Any program that is specifically aimed for the legal accounting program aimed at the legal practice will have the functionality to split between trust and business. So if you need to extract any trust accounting records or any ledgers for your clients, the program itself will be able to tell you this is the business records and these are the trust records. So now a lot of you guys are probably going to start wondering because you've opted for Pastel, it's the cheapest, but now you are not sure, does your bookkeeper know how to capture your accounting records? Correct, if they are not used to doing legal accounting. So here's your test, how to test whether your bookkeeper is doing it correctly. So the moment you've done, you are done with this lecture, call your bookkeeper and ask them to extract a list of trust creditors from the accounting system <clears throat> and manage or compare that list of trust creditors to your trust bank balance. So we are now on the 4th of July. So I would suggest ask them to provide you with a list of trust creditors as at the 30th of June. And you will then very easily see whether they can do that. If they can't do that, in other words, they've mixed the business and trust accounting records, then your accounting records are not compliant with the rules. And the moment you get a trust audit, it's going to become a nightmare for you. So that's the simple test. Ask them to extract a list of trust creditors and compare that to your trust bank balance as at the 30th of June and make sure that those two are the same. And then also, when you open your trust account, ask your banker to activate the sweeping function on your trust and also on your section 86 for investments. So what does that actually mean? Now, as you know, there's a rule that says that all the interest less earned on your trust account, less the bank charges incurred on your trust account must be paid to the law society. Now, a few years ago, that was done once a year during the audit and the Law Society would be happy to receive your check. But then subsequently, the rule has changed. You, will, you now have to pay your trust interest to the Law Society on a monthly basis. Now, that is not only an administrative nightmare because you have to do the calculation yourself and make the payment yourself. So ask the bank to activate this function and this function will then automatically pay the interest less bank charges from your trust account to the law society and on your investments as well. Now, in 98% of cases, your bank will set this function up and the function will work correctly. However, I have seen from each bank at least one or two cases where they've activated it and the function does not actually work correctly. It doesn't do the calculation correct or sometimes it pulls the business bank charges through to the against the trust account, the interest earned on the trust account. And I've also seen where all the interest in the trust account gets paid out to the law society. They don't deduct the bank charges. And that then actually leads to a trust shortfall. So the short note, activate the sweeping function. And after you've activated for the first two or three months, double check the calculation to make sure that the interest less bank charges exclusive of that gets paid over to the Law Society. Now I want to look at some of the statutory requirements when setting up your own business. So the first one is obviously to register yourself with the Legal Practice Council. Then the next one is we need to register with SARS. Now we are going to have a look at the basic taxes shortly. So I will then go into how which taxes you need to register for and how that works. 
Okay, then the next one is you have to appoint an auditor. Now, my note on that is when you are looking at account, appointing auditors, please ask the guys whether they have other attorneys as clients and whether they have actually done trust audits before. Um, if they don't know how to try do trust audits, the chances of them getting your one correct the first time is very little. It's a, it's a, I wouldn't say it's a rocket science to do, but if you haven't done it before, it's not an easy step to take. Now, if your auditor messes up your trust account audit and sends it to the Law Society, it's not the end of the world. The Law Society will basically contact you and say that the report that was sent to them does not match their records or is not correct, and you will have to go back to the auditors. They'll have to fix up whatever they did wrong, and you can then resend it to the Law Society. So it's not like you'll get this barred from day one, but the problem with that is it's schlep to now have to go through that with the Law Society and then go back to the auditors, get them to redraft the report, send it in again. And I've seen cases where it goes back and forth about three or four times before the Law Society is actually happy with the report. So my quick note on that is make sure that the auditors that you appoint are well acquainted with trust audits. And then also make sure that they are registered with the IRBA, the Independent Regulatory Board for Auditors. This is a check that the Law Society, well, sorry, when I say Law Society, uh, I then obviously mean the Legal Practice Council. I sometimes get confused between the two. Well, sometimes just used to the old name. Um, so the LPC will actually check their registration. And if they aren't in good standing with the IRBA, then the LPC will not accept that trust audit. So again, you won't get disbarred for that, but that means you will now have to find new auditors and the new auditors will have to do a new audit for you. Um, and the other problem with that is in many times you will have already paid the old auditor, so those funds will then be completely lost. So on the auditors, make sure they know how to do trust audits and make sure they're in good standing with the RBA. Okay, then there's a rule that says you must balance your trust assets to your trust liabilities every three months. That is what the rule says. However, if you run any form of legal accounting software, that software will do that for you automatically on a monthly basis and let you know the moment that relationship goes out of sync. If you use a manual system like Pastel or Excel, a non-legal accounting software, then I'm going to suggest that you do that test every month. The reason for that being is you don't want to, if there is a problem in your trust and you have accidentally paid out more funds than what you were supposed to, you don't want to wait three months before you pick up on that. So rather make sure every month when you close off your accounts that your trust assets and your trust liabilities are the same. Then there's a rule that says update and reconcile trust account monthly. So what does that mean? That means that you have to write up into the ledgers like we are going to do on a monthly basis. So the rule basically says that you are never allowed to be more than one month behind. So if we are now in June, it means your June accounting records for trust must have been written up into some accounting system by the end of July. So you can't actually go and give your trust bank statements to your accountants once a year and say, okay, guys, quickly capture my bank statements and do a trust audit for me. You have to do it monthly to comply with the rules. Then there is a Opening audit and annual trust audits. These relate to trust now. The LPC doesn't really have too much of an idea or I almost want to say worry too much what happens on your business side. They are more phased about what's happening in your trust account. So for that, you have to, when you start up your business, submit an opening audit to the Law Society. And from there on, you have to submit an annual audit every year. 
but there is a slide coming up giving some more details on the trust audits. Then, if you are, when do you have to register for UIF? And the answer is the moment you have staff, you must register with the UIF and you must list that staff with the UIF so that when the staff leaves, they can go and claim UIF. Now, many employers, when they start up their business, neglect to take this step or do this. So what then happens is the, and normally it's not a problem until the time where you fire one of your staff members and they then run to the UIF and if they get there, they won't be able to claim. And that is obviously a big problem for everyone. And then also we've now seen with COVID, there might actually be some advantages to UIF because if you have been UIF registered and your business has now suffered a loss because of COVID, then you can, well, yeah, you can still at this point, submit UIF claims for April, May and June to be refunded for your losses that you've incurred because of COVID. So there might actually be some advantages. And on that note of UIF, how do we calculate UIF? So UIF is a 1% contribution by the employer and a 1% deduction from the employee. So if you employ an employee for 100 rand a month, then your UIF will be 2 rand. 1 rand comes off his pay, so he will only actually receive 99 rand, and you will have to contribute the other 1 rand. So for every 100 rand salary you pay employee, 2 rand of that must go to the UIF. Then you also have to register with for the compensation of well, occupational injuries. So that basically means that if you have staff and especially clerks and they are on the road, if you register, well, you have to register with COIDA and that will then assist them should they get injured on the job. Now, obviously, most of you guys will be office bound, so it's not as big a risk um, as if you had a construction company or a workshop. But there's definitely still risk of someone falling down a flight of stairs or being in an accident on the job. And the moment you have not registered, then that family is going to come after you for those funds if they can't claim that from COIDA. And then we have SDL. So how does SDL work? The moment your payroll your annual payroll exceeds 500,000 Rand. So if you have staff plus your salaries over 500,000 Rand, then you have to register for SDL. And SDL is also a 1% contribution, but sadly that is only a employer contribution. So that's going to come directly from your pocket as the owner of this business. Now I just want to quickly highlight the fact or, or highlight UIF and SDL gets paid through the SARS website. So when you submit your PAYE to SARS, you will pay over the UIF and the F SDL to SARS and SARS will then pay the funds over to the UIF. Now a mistake that a lot of people make is they think that the moment you pay your UIF through that platform, they have complied with everything that needs to in terms of UIF. And that is in fact not the case. After paying that to SARS, you need to submit a form to the UIF, which is a UI-19. And on that form, you must every time there's new staff or staff that left or changes in salaries, you must notify the UIF and this must be sent directly to them. So when we handled all of these UIF claims now due to COVID, we had a whole number of people that came to us and say, no, they've paid the UIF, but they pay it to SARS. They've never taken the step of actually registering their business with the UIF. It's a separate registration and a separate registration number that you must get. 
So that's on UIF. Okay, then we've already got the little tick here for Fika. So on Fika, I want to just say this has become a massive thing at the moment, obviously with all the fraud that's going on in our country. So you have to be registered with the Financial Intelligence Center and you have to get a registration number from them. Now that number must actually be displayed on your trust audit. So you can't get around the step. And then what a lot of people do is they forget to register with FICA. And then when the auditors come the day before your audit submission is due to the law society, then they ask you for this number and you haven't got it. Now you start sparking to do the registration and it takes a few days to do. So now your audit will go in late, which we don't want to do. So make sure you register with the FIC and please also make sure that you comply with all the rules there. Obviously in this lecture, we're not going to go into that, but the most basic rule is the moment you receive cash to the value as in hard cash to the value of 25,000 rand or more, then you have to declare that to the FIC. If you don't and that comes out, then you are looking at a 10 year or 10 million rand, well, 10 year jail sentence or 10 million rand penalty. So you don't want to be on the wrong side of the FIC. Okay, then for purposes of law society and well, I normally make a note here, we have to retain our accounting records for five years. But I always say for SARS purposes, retain it for as long as you can. We've had cases now where SARS comes and randomly opens up old, old, old cases and asks people for supporting documents. And in the case where you can't provide those documents, they will simply assess you for or reverse all of your expenses and assess you on the higher amount. So the more proof you have of what you've done, the better. And then also remember to apply for your Fidelity Fund Certificate. Now that portal normally opens around about October of every year and you have to have your new Fidelity Fund Certificate by the 1st of January of the new calendar year. They run in calendar year cycles. So your note on that is the first time you have to do that application. Do not wait till the 31st of December and then try to log onto the website and obtain your certificate. The first time you do it is going to be absolute, uh, absolute nightmare. Um, once you know how the website works and you've battled all your battles with it, then it's actually a very nice website and it's very convenient to get hold of your Fidelity Fund certificate. But the first time, take a good four or five hours out of your day to try and figure out how to get to the point where you can actually apply. It's got a whole lot of questions and financial information that you need to fill in on the website. And then also remember, once you've sent that through, it must actually be approved by someone from the Law Society. So in this last year, that was almost a two week process. So if you are on the banking panels or anything like that, again, do not wait till the 31st of December because you will not have your new certificate on the 1st of January. So just a note on those ones. Okay, then I want to start and have a look at taxes. So we are not going to be going into too much detail of taxes, but just into the basics. So the first note I've made is when do we have to register for tax? Now let's first look if you are in your personal capacity. So if you are still working for a boss and you are getting a pay slip every month and they deduct your tax there, then you will have an income tax number with SARS. So now what happens if you start your own business and you run it as a sole proprietorship? Do you now need to go and re-register your sole proprietorship and get a new income tax number from SARS? And the answer is no. You will have your normal income tax number that you had as an employee and you will submit your business financial statements under that same number. If you go the route of incorporation or a company, 
then that is a new legal entity. And because of that, that company will have to be separately registered for income tax. So if you go the route of Inc, you will have a personal income tax number and your business will have its own income tax number. Now, the way that things are done, CIPC has linked their system with SARS. So if you now, for the last few years, register a company, then the CIPC will immediately talk to SARS and already issue that company with the income tax number. So that's quite convenient because you don't have to do a new registration for the company. It will already have an income tax number. So then just a quick one to have a look at the tax rate. So there I've copied the table for you for this year. So you can see there if you are individual, your tax rate varies between 18 and 45 percent. So if you earn less than, well, if you earn in the lower brackets, it will be lower than company tax, but in the higher brackets, it will be higher than company tax. And then I've put there the individual tax deadlines and penalties. So there we can see filing season this year is going to open on the 1st of September and run to the 16th of November for guys who do the e-filing and up to 22 October for guys who can't submit electronically. And then up the 29th of Jan for provisional taxpayers. Now we're going to look at provisional tax a little bit later, but at this point, if you are working for a boss and you earn a monthly salary on a payslip, you are not a provisional taxpayer. So your deadline is going to be the 22nd of October. If you are a sole proprietor or a director of a company, you have to be a provisional taxpayer in terms of the act. So you have to activate that function on your e-filing, but that also then extends your tax deadline up to the 29th of January. So at this point, what happens if we submit our tax returns late. Now, in practice, so there's obviously the Tax Administration Act that will tell you that you will immediately be penalized if you do that. But from experience, if you submit your tax return within the few days after the deadline, you won't have a problem with administrative penalties. At, these, at this point, I can see that guys who haven't filed for the last two years, are starting to receive administrative penalties. So that is penalties just for the fact that you haven't submitted your tax return. There's a whole other set of penalties for amounts for tax that you should have paid. The bulk of tax penalties are on payments and late payments, not necessarily on submissions. But just, so just on a note, it's if you miss this deadline, yeah, it's not the end of the world. You won't be immediate. Well, I'm not saying you won't be, but most probably you will not be penalized on the 17th of November or the 23rd of October. But if you don't submit it within a reasonable amount of time, SARS will start leaving administrative penalties on your tax returns. Okay, and then if we look at company taxes, the companies pay a fixed tax rate of 28%. So that's why I said some of the personal tax rates are lower than company tax and some of them are higher. So what you need to do, oh, so just a note on that, companies tax returns are due 12 months after its year end. So most companies are registered with a February year end because that's our country's financial year end. And then you basically have a year. So by the 28th of Feb of the next year, you have to submit your return. If you are a June or any other year end, month as a year end, then you've got 12 months from there to submit your tax return. Then I said, you've got to be clever. You must look the moment you start working for yourself and you have incorporation. You must look at your tax and your company's tax at one. So you've got to play around with your salary so that you pay the lowest possible rate between you and your company, because all the money, whether it's in the company or in your name, it's all your monies. 
So just a quick example, if I have a company and that company has made 100,000 rand profit, then the tax on that is going to be 28,000 rand. If I am an individual and I earn a salary of 100,000 rand and you go back to the previous slides tax table, you will see that falls into the 18% bracket and you will only pay 18,000 rand. So if you have a company and you've made 100,000 rand profit, but you haven't drawn any salary from that company, then I would rather suggest to put a journal through and declare a salary for you of 100,000 rand and rather have that profit taxed in your personal capacity. So in the company, the company will then have 100,000 rand profit, less your salary of 100,000 rand. So the company have, will have zero profit, so no tax payable there, and you will only pay 18,000 rand. So by doing a simple declaration of a salary, whether you take it or not, you can save an easy 10,000 rand in tax there. Now, obviously, this is much more complex than on my slide here, but I just wanted to explain the basic principle of how to look at you, your and your company combined in terms of how much you can take as a salary and to give yourself the optimum tax position. <coughs> then I've made some notes. Make sure that when you work with your accountants that you do claim for all of the expenses that you are allowed to. So any expense that you incur, so the Act says if it's as long as it's in the production of income, you are allowed to claim that. So at this point, almost all of us are working from our houses. So the moment you work from your house, you are allowed a tax deduction for that. So the basically the calculation for that is you take your office, the room that you've converted into your home office, you work out the squares on that room and work that out as a percentage of your entire house, not your property, the house, the under roof square meterage. And whatever that percentage is, you can claim of all of your expenses relating to the house. So that will include your interest on your bond, your municipal account, your domestic worker salary, your repairs to the house, all of those type of expenses, you are then legally allowed to claim. Then traveling and personal motor vehicles. So a lot of people will have, you bought your car while you're still working for a boss, and now you start your own business and you've incorporated that. Now the car is in your name, so you can't depreciate it in the business but you still use your car for travel purposes. So you then keep a logbook of your motor vehicle so that you can see what's the split between business and private. And whatever that split is, you are allowed to claim on all of your motor vehicle related expenses. So that will include your fuel, your insurance on your motor vehicle and any repairs to your motor vehicle in that percentage of business versus total traveling, but you have to do a logbook to be able to claim that. So my note on that is remember, if you are using your vehicle, make sure your accountant does give you some form of tax benefit if that cars in your personal capacity. So basically you can rent the car to the business, something in that line, but just make sure that you do claim for your use of your motor vehicle. Then also, so entertainment is a is a very highly disputed area, but at this stage, a lot of guys, especially startup businesses, will not have its own offices. We all see clients in restaurants or pubs or coffee shops. So if you do that, you are allowed to claim. So what I advise all of my clients to do is when you go to a coffee shop with a client, then after you pay the bill, obviously you have to pay the bill, otherwise there's no deduction for it. But the moment you pay the bill, on the back of the slip, write the client's code from your accounting system and give a short description. It was a first consultation with client or a meeting about this and this and this matter. And that will help you should you get a SARS audit to explain why you are claiming this as entertainment. It will give them more 
or put them at ease that this entertainment was genuine in the production of income. And then the other one is interest on loan accounts. So it's a very healthy financial position for your business to owe you money, as in you must put money into your company. The moment you do that, you can charge interest on that loan that you've made to your company. That interest is deductible in the company, but a large portion of that is exempt in your personal capacity. So that way you decrease the company's income tax without having to increase your own personal tax. So that's just a few pointers on income tax. My basic note is make sure that you do claim for all the expenses that you are allowed to. Now we get to provisional tax. Now what is provisional tax? The answer is it's basically exactly what it says. We are provisionally paying our tax, our income tax. So what does that mean? If I have a my own business, let's say I have a sole proprietorship, I'm ultimately going to be taxed on my business profit. But I will only be able to determine what my business profit is at the end of the financial year. So then SARS came and said, but we are not going to wait until the end of the financial year. We want you to twice a year after six months and then after 12 months, pay your tax provisionally. So what does that mean? That means we have to do an estimate of how much tax we think we are going to, how much profit we are going to make for that financial year. And then we have to pay the tax on that. So let's just have a quick look at provisional taxes. Who should register as provisional taxpayers? Now the answer to that is, if you run a sole proprietor or run your business as a sole proprietor, you have to be a provisional taxpayer. If you are a director of a company, you have to be a provisional taxpayer. If you have a company, that company must be a provisional taxpayer. So basically the only guys who aren't provisional taxpayers are the guys working for a boss and earning a salary on a payslip every month. So let's have a quick look at what that calculation will look like. So your first payment will be due within six months of your financial year. So then I basically said our year to date profit. So let's say our profit for the six months was 60,000 Rand. We times that by two. So our estimated profit for the whole financial year after 12 months is 120,000. So then I worked out at company tax rates, the tax thereon would be 33,600. So that would be my tax for the whole financial year. And because we're now only halfway into the year, we can divide that by two, and that will give us provisional tax payable of 16,800. Now, this is payable on the last business day of the six of your six months into your financial year. If you pay that one day late, you will pay a 10% penalty on that. So then a thousand six hundred rand will be added on top of that payment. Then we get to our second payment. Now our second payment has to happen on the last day of our financial year. Now at this point, we'll be able to match more accurately judge what our, or estimate what our year-end profit will be. So in this case, I said now that we closer to year-end, it went a little better than what we estimated half year. So our year-end profit is now 140,000. <clears> so then you simply work out your tax there on, which is then 140,000 times 28%, gives you 39,200. And we deduct the amount that we've already paid. Because remember, half year we paid half of what we thought the profit would be. So my second provisional tax payment would then be 22,400 Rand. And again, if you pay that one day late or later, you will immediately receive a 10% penalty on that. 
So that's a 2,200 rand penalty that you don't want. So then quite a few guys got clever with this and they say, oh, but why don't we underestimate our profits? And then when we submit our final tax return, because remember your final tax return is only due one year after your year end. So then on our final tax return, we'll just go, oh, geez, this year was actually a lot better than what we estimated. And then we pay our taxes then. So then so I said, these calculations of yours have to be, if you under a million rand turnover, 80% accurate and over a million rand turnover, 90% accurate. The moment you estimate a value less than either 80 or 90% of your actual uh, profit, then we are going to penalize you with an under provision penalty of 20% of that amount that we underestimated by. So these estimates have to be fairly accurate. Then we get to VAT, value added tax. So let's look at some notes on that. When do you have to register for VAT? And the answer is the moment your turnover exceeds 1 million Rand. If you trade and you do not register for VAT in time, then SARS can go back to the years where your turnover did exceed a million Rand and actually penalize you with the VAT on your turnover for past financial years. So if you've been trading for three or four years and your turnover is over a million Rand, then SARS can go back and penalize you quite badly on that. So make sure that you register in the month or two after your turnover reaches one million Rand. Then I made some notes to say, oh, just a note on that. A lot of guys, or I see a lot of accountants that handle advocate invoices and disbursements incorrectly. If you are clever in the way that you do your accounting, you do not show advocates and sheriffs and corresponding attorneys under your income line item, because it's not actually income for your business. So a lot of guys on the accounting records inflate their income by the advocate invoices, and then they claim the advocate invoices as the expense. So that step is fine. You are not inflating your profit, but you are inflating your turnover, and it will make you have to register for VAT sooner. Now, the problem with VAT is why you might not want to register for VAT is VAT is based on the accrual basis. So the moment I invoice my client, VAT has to be paid over to SARS. Now, if that client does not pay me within 60 days, you still have to pay the VAT over to SARS. So if you have a large debtors book, then paying over VAT is going to be an issue for you and it's going to have a negative effect on your cash flow because you will have to fund that VAT for until your client pays you. So in general, if you have a litigation type practice or something like that, you don't want to be registered for that. But the moment your turnover reaches a million, you obviously have to, but make sure you don't over inflate your turnover. Then I'll put a note in to say, when might you actually want to register for that? When will this be in your advantage? And the answer is the moment you don't have a big debtors book. So in other words, guys who do conveyancing or guys who work because the moment the case pays out, then you take your fee. So there's never a large amount of time that lapses between where you write your fee and where the client pays you. So why do I say you then want to register for VAT? So remember, the VAT that you have to pay to SARS is based on your fees and you levy that on top of your fee. You'll see when we get to ledgers, that will make some more sense. But basically, you don't pay the VAT. Your client actually pays the VAT to you and you pay it over to SARS. But you then, or you can then also claim VAT on all of your business related VATable expenses. So that means your client is paying the VAT over to you, but SARS will then give you 
discount, basically, if I can use that word, on 15% of your expenses. So in effect, SARS is paying for 15% of all of your business vetable expenses. So in that case, you might want to register for VAT. So then I just put a note there. So VAT output is the VAT levied on top of your fees. And that is the VAT that you have to pay over to SARS. VAT input is the VAT claimed on expenses. So that's the term. So when I talk about VAT output, that's the VAT on our fees to our clients. VAT input is the VAT that we're claiming back from SARS on the expenses that we incur when generating those fees. And then the, you can be either classified as a category A or B VAT vendor. So what that basically means is you will either fall in the even or odd VAT cycle. And then a VAT cycle is normally two months long. So what that means is you will, on all of your fees, raise outputs for a period of two months. And on all of your expenses, claim the input. So you basically have an output schedule and an input schedule for two months. Now, at the end of those two months, you say, this is my VAT output is 10 Rand and my VAT input is 6 Rand. So the difference between those two, which is then 4 Rand, that is payable on the last working day of the third month. So you will do your calculation over a two month period and that has to be submitted and paid to SARS by the third month. What happens if you pay that one day or longer late? That is immediately a 10% penalty on that amount. Okay, so that's just some of the basic facts around VAT and you can get your accountant to help you on those VAT calculations and help you to understand that a little bit better. Now, for purposes of our assignment, VAT is applicable on some of the questions in our assignment. So what I've done is I've given you guys this little basic amount or this little basic calculator. So basically, this column here, this middle column, tells you what you have. This is what you want. So let me explain that in some more details. If the question gives me the exclusive of that amount and I need to calculate how much is the inclusive amount, you take exclusive times 1.15. If the question gives me inclusive, so this is what I want, that column there is what I have. So if the question gave me the inclusive amount and I want to calculate exclusive, then you divide by 1.15. If the question gives me the inclusive amount and I want to calculate the VAT portion itself, then you times by 15 and divide by 115. And if they give me the exclusive amount and I want the VAT, I times it by 15 divided by 100. Now you'll see this is applicable on question one of the assignment. On question one of the assignment, you have to, in your ledgers, split between fees and VAT. And I want to say almost 30% of the assignments where that I mark, the guys calculate the VAT portion incorrectly because the assignment gives you the inclusive amount. And then everyone goes and they just say, okay, to get the VAT, you take inclusive, divide by or times 15%. And it doesn't actually work out the same. If you take exclusive, you can times it by 15% to get the VAT. But if they give you inclusive, it's times 15 over 115. So that's a very important note for especially question one. So use these little, if I was you, take a snapshot of this on your phone now and use that little guide when you attend question one. So then I've just got a quick example of a VAT calculation. So let's say your billing rate is 1,500 Rand exclusive of VAT. You consult with a client for one hour and you raise an invoice. Then you go to CNA and you purchase stationery of 600 Rand inclusive of that. Remember, whatever amount you pay in the shop is always the 
inclusive amount. So I have a liability towards SARS. Remember, I have to pay SARS on money that I get in. So I calculate my liability towards SARS, 1,500 rands times 15%. So 225 rand I have to pay to SARS. But now I can claim for the stationery that I used. So I'm going to say back, claim back 600 rand times 15 over 115. I use that calculation because I have the inclusive amount and I need to calculate the VAT. So my claim portion will be 78 rand 26. And now how much do I have to pay to SARS? My fee portion less my expense portion and I have to pay SARS 164 rand and 74 cents. What happens in the case where I have more expenses than what I have income. In other words, my claim portion is larger than my liability portion. And the answer is, in that case, SARS will actually pay you those funds back. They will pay you your claim amount back, but they will never do it without a fight. So they will first do a review on your VAT return where you have to then send them your calculations plus some supporting documents. They want to see some of the invoices to make sure that you aren't falsely claiming for expenses that you didn't incur. And then the moment you've done that, or they verify those documents, then they will physically pay the money back to you. Yes, okay, so there I put that note. Will SARS pay out the claim portion is larger than liability? And the answer is yes. <clears throat> now we get to pay as you earn. So what is pay as you earn? When do you have to register for pay as you earn? The answer is the moment you get employees, you have to register for pay as you earn. That means that if you employ an employee for let's say 15,000 Rand, then you've got to go to the tax tables that I, the income tax tables that I showed earlier, and you've got to calculate how much of the employee's salary you have to deduct for SARS. Now, if you pay your employee on the 25th of the month, you pay them the net of tax amount. And now that portion, so let's say on 15,000 Rand for argument's sake, 2,000 Rand is tax. So you pay them 13,000 Rand. That 2,000 Rand needs to be paid to SARS by the seventh of the next month. So I've put a little example in here to say, to show you how a salary calculation will work. So you take the gross annual salary and apply the percentage. So in this case, deduct this amount and pay the employee. So let's say we employ someone for 10,000 Rand a month. To compare that to the tax tables, I need to calculate how much that is annually. So that will be 10,000 Rand times 12. That gets me 100. So this guy in a whole year will earn 120,000 Rand. Now, if you go to your tax tables, you will see that 120,000 Rand falls in the 18% tax bracket. So that means for a full financial year, this guy must pay 21,600 Rand in tax. And if I then divide that by 12, that basically means that this guy is paying 1,800 Rand monthly tax. Now, there's some uh, rebates that comes off that that will decrease that amount, but I'm just trying to explain the basic idea of how to do this calculation. So on the 25th of month, the month you are going to pay this guy 8,200 Rand, and then by the last working day before the 7th of the next month, you have to pay that amount that you deducted from his salary over to SARS. Then I've put a note in here, but what if you are self-employed or a sole proprietor? What we do for a lot of clients is we basically make them employ themselves. So if you run a sole proprietor and you know you earn more or less 30,000 Rand a month, then what we do is you can actually register yourself as an employer and employ yourself. 
and then you do a pay slip for yourself every month for 30,000 Rand and you pay the PAYE on that. And all the amounts that you pay as PAYE then basically comes off of your provisional tax payment. So the reason we do that is it helps your cash flow and your budgeting because now you don't get this big fright twice a year on how much tax you have to pay. You can budget for it monthly and pay out the tax on that, pay the PAYE on that, and then you don't have to pay those lump sum uh, provisional tax payments. But again, chat to your accountant, they should be able to help you with that. Now let's look at audit report deadlines. So when you start up your practice, you have to submit the opening order to the LPC within the first six full months. So if you start in the middle of the month, you don't count that month. You only start counting the months from your first full month. And you must report on your first four months of trading. So it means you, so basically you can only submit this between month five and six, because you must first trade for four months. And after you've traded for four months, you give those accounting records to your auditors and they check that everything's in order and then they submit your opening audit to the Law Society. Now, the report for the opening audit and the annual audit looks exactly the same. It's actually exactly the same thing. So it's like a mini audit that they do just to make sure that you are on the right track. Otherwise, if they let you trade for a year or 18 months before your first check, and you haven't done it correctly, then obviously there's much more that needs to be corrected. Then after you've done your opening audit, then you fall into the annual audit cycle. So then you have to submit your annual audit reports within six months after year end. So if your year end is February, like most of you guys are, the deadline for that is submission is the 31st of August. However, for this year and this year only, they have extended that to 30 September due to the month that we lost with COVID. So annual audits you're going to submit for every year that you trade. Then after a few years, you close your practice. Then when you close your practice, you have to submit a closing order to the LPC within three months after the bank account is closed. Now that I just want to highlight for you guys, because what a lot of guys do, they close their practice. In, in other words, they close their doors. There's no more business happening. But they say, but we're going to keep the bank account open because clients will still be paying monies in there that owe us for fees. But let's do a closing audit. You can't do that because the moment a new transaction comes in, that has to be audited. So that's why the LPC is very strict. You have to submit proof of the exact date that you closed all of your bank accounts. So no more monies can come in. And only then can your auditors start to do your closing audit. Then a lot of people don't know this. If you have less than five transactions, so the actual law says a, mini a minimal amount of transactions to trust. So I've worked it out to more or less five. If you have less than five transactions, then you can apply for exemption so that you don't have to be audited by your auditors. So there's a form that you fill in for the Law Society and you attach your bank statements. And the nice thing about this is the cost of this is 575 Rand where a full trust audit is anything from about 5,000 Rand up to very large amounts. So if you can get around it by simply doing this exemption application, then I would definitely suggest it. So if you don't use your trust account actively, if you basically just invoice your clients and they pay all of those fees into your business account, then you don't have to, you don't have to submit a trust audit. Then I also made a note to say, make sure you submit a refund application. A lot of attorneys don't know, but the, the Fidelity Fund will actually refund you because they're the ones that say you have to be audited, but they then also help you to pick up the tab for that. So with your audit, when you submit the audit or shortly after, 
make sure that your auditor or you submit a refund application and the Fidelity Fund will then pay you back. Uh, if, uh, I think it is 4,000 Rand or the higher of 4,000 Rand or 20% of the interest that you pay to them. So if you do conveyancing or RAF and you have large amounts of funds in your trust, then they will refund you a larger portion than the guys that don't keep any. But the minimum amount is 4,000. So even if you have almost no monies in trust, they'll still refund you 4,000 rand. And then I just want to bring this under your attention. It stays your sub responsibility to submit on time. A lot of guys, and sadly, there is a lot of accountants and auditors out there that do not render a very good service. You give them all of your records and they just don't get back to you. And then a lot of guys think, well, I'm going to be called for a disciplinary hearing at the Law Society, but I'm going to blame it on the accountants. Sadly, that doesn't fly with the Law Society. It always stays your responsibility to for what happens in your trust account and also to submit your trust audits on time. OK, then what if you miss the deadline? Now, I don't want to go into too much details here, but yeah, in from my experience, if you submitted like within the week after your submission or after the deadline, the Law Society will pretty much accept it without any queries or issues there. Um, if after a few weeks have passed and you still don't submit, you will get an administrative penalty of 575 Rand plus a final demand for your trust audit. If you then do not respond to that and submit the trust audit, then you will be called for a disciplinary hearing. <coughs> and on that disciplinary hearing, I don't want to say the exact amounts, um, but yeah, then you are going to pay a significantly higher fine. And after, if that's a first offence, it will still be a fine. And I think after the second offence, they will actually start taking actions against you. So yeah, in general, you don't want to submit this late. And the other thing is, if you submit, if you don't submit your annual audit, you can also, it holds back your fidelity fund. So you are not actually allowed to trade at all. If you don't have a fidelity fund certificate and you can't get that if you don't submit your audit report. So in general, make sure you, you submit your audit at least on time. If you, for whatever reason, can't submit it on the exact date, make sure you submit it in the few days afterwards. Okay, then accountants and software. Now, in this case, there's lots of legal accounting software out there. Um, um, all of them do more or less the same thing. Uh, we work with a program called Legal Suite, so you guys are welcome to go and check that out on their website. Um, but yeah, uh, different software will work for different types of firms. The larger firms will have to have much more integrated software and but obviously there's a cost involved to that as well um, in general i tell the guys get the right accounting software from the start you'll remember i made the comments to say get your controls and processes sorted out from the start now if you get the correct legal accounting software from the start it will make your whole life and billing process a whole lot easier because everyone tries to do this manually. So you type up all of your invoices manually. You send it to clients. Then the clients don't pay. So you've got to then do statements manually. And in a whole lot of cases, those invoices and statements get missing and you actually lose out on quite a lot of money because you don't run decent accounting software. So what most legal accounting packages will do is it will give you a time recording function where you basically just dot down all of the time that you spend at work. Then from there, you can select whichever fee notes you then want to bill on to clients and send that for invoicing. And then from there, the process automates itself. So by the click of a button, you can send out all of your invoices in one go. By the click of a button, you can send out statements to all clients that owe you money. 
by the click of a button, you can add interest onto all of your clients that owe you money for 30 or 60 days or more. So basically, what I've found with people is if you run a manual system, you forget about people that owe you money. And if you take that cost of losing out on funds into account, then you might as well just have purchased the correct software from the beginning and save yourself. It will cost you the same at the end of the day. But especially when you get very busy and your practice starts growing, you have to have the correct software to manage your practice. Okay. Then also there's lots of online little payroll programs that will also make your life a whole lot easier than trying to generate manual pay slips for your employees. Like a simple one is called PaySpace. It's a little online program. Just as a point, I don't get anything out of this. I'm not linked to any of these programs. So I don't get any commission for using their names. I'm literally doing this to try and help you guys to get some nice software for a cheap price. Okay, so check out uh, yeah, PaySpace for some payroll software. That will help you to generate your employees' pay slips every month. Okay, I've already spoken about your time saving and that it's an automated process. And then also I said, appoint an accountant with legal accounting experience. You guys might have some friends and everyone that has got BCom degrees and want to do some work after hours, but make sure legal accounting is a specialized separate field. If the guys don't know how to account for trust accounts specifically, then they are going to make a mess of your accounting records. So chat to the guys and make sure they understand how legal accounting works because the lawyer's books are completely different from the shop down the road. And then also check up on their work. I've again talked or I talked about it earlier, but I again want to say if you have accountants, check up on the reports that they send through. Make sure they send you reports and ledgers of what they've processed on your system and make sure that that agrees, that your trust account balances agrees to what the trial balance says, that your debtors, uh, your trust creditors and your trust assets agree to each other. And then also made a note to say, you are, be very careful to grant access to bank accounts. Um, most of the fraud cases that I've seen and helped with and worked on is where the guys trust the accountants too much and they give them access to banks. And the moment you have access to the bank accounts, you can move monies around as you wish. So be very careful of that. Yes, there's honest mistakes, but in general, people in desperate situations will do anything to survive. So Rather keep access to the bank accounts for yourself and give them the function of, like I said, either loading payments, but you still release and then basically just capturing that on the system. And then I said backups, backups, backups. If I can tell you how many guys I have in tears calling me every year with their databases lost. Um, you don't have to run expensive servers and IT costs to run backups. Uh, at this stage, yes, I know it's not the most safe thing to use, Dropbox or OneDrive, but it's definitely better than nothing. So if you are a startup and you can't afford all the IT costs of having a proper server and proper system set up, at least just download Dropbox or OneDrive. It's free programs and make sure that you at least back up your data there and especially your accounting software. Then also just make a note to if your account or if your IT guys say yes, your system is being backed up, make a hundred percent sure that where are they backing it up? Are they backing it up to a cloud or are they backing it up to a hard drive? Um, and also test the backups, especially if you run legal accounting software a lot of them have very specific files that need to be backed up. Uh, there's a program file and then there's the data files. And a lot of the IT guys that don't know that will then back up the programs, but never the data. So if you get lost, you can reinstall the program or if your computer gets stolen, you can reinstall the program, but you don't get your data back. And the data is actually the more important thing. So just make sure that the guys know their way around what they do. And then obviously you guys are going to have a whole class on risk and insurance, but just a few things from an accounting perspective. Okay, so there's obviously professional indemnity insurance. 
my only note on that is remember that that doesn't cover you for internet fraud or staff stealing monies from your trust account. A lot of guys are on the impression that if my accountant or someone logs into my trust and steals the money there, professional indemnity insurance will cover those funds. They don't. That is only for when you make a wrong call on someone's case or advise them incorrectly and they suffer a loss. So professional indemnity insurance is not going to cover you for internet fraud. Then the second insurance, which I think is a uh, you can't go wrong having this, especially if you work for yourself, is income protection insurance. So because you are a professional person, your income protection insurance will kick in after seven days, where normal people's will only kick in after a month. But that basically means that the moment you are ill for seven days or more and you can't work, you will receive a payout from them and it's not a very expensive insurance versus the payouts. You're looking at about 700 Rand per 50,000, 700 Rand a month contribution for a 50,000 Rand a month payout. So it's definitely, in my opinion, worthwhile to have that insurance. Then we need short term insurance over our assets. So if we have cars and laptops and everything that we use for work, please make sure that those are insured. Um, and also a note on that, if you use, if you have your personal car and you actually use it for work, you've got to inform your insurance about that. Otherwise, you are not covered. So make sure when you, when you move over from being an employee to starting your own business that you contact your insurance broker and let them know about this so that they make all the necessary changes to your policies. And then, Key man insurance is a very good insurance to have if you are two people or more running the business. Now, without going into too much info, but basically what this does is if you are two partners and one of you would pass away, then the other partner's remaining spouse or children will receive a nice large payout and you will receive the balance of the shares of the company. So that helps you in the sense that you don't then suddenly sit with new guys that you don't actually want to be in business with that inherited the shares of your business and secondly it will help those guys because they don't necessarily want the shares they will rather want money in the bank so <coughs> key man insurance will help you with that okay then that is the end of our slideshow for the morning session so we'll have a well we'll chat about a uh, possible q and a session if you guys require that but yeah i hope this was helpful in terms of just helping you to start up your business and set up and register for everything that is necessary and then there will be another video as far as i know that will then start with ledgers and accounting reports and actually setting up your accounting records